Welcome in now to our social distance series for 24-7 sports, uh, Penn State head coach James Franklin. Um, coach, uh, appreciate you joining me. Uh, I, I've got a couple little girls in the quarantine. I know you, you're a girl dad as well. Uh, first things first, you know, how's, how's life in the quarantine with, with a couple of preteens? Uh, you hanging in there? Yeah, actually, my one just turned 13. So there we go. <laughs> I got a 13-year-old and a 12-year-old, and I've told a couple people the first two weeks was awesome. You know, they're like, Dad, we wake up in the morning, and you're there. It's awesome. We go to bed at night, and you tuck us in, and, and it's awesome. And then week three came around. They're like, we, we've had about enough of your ass. We'll back to work. That's right. Well, what's, 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 the, uh, what's the Franklin routine uh, when you're on house arrest right now? You got any shows? Or you, do you unwind at night with a Netflix show? Or you have what's, any books? What's going on other than football for you? Yeah, so uh, me and my wife usually at night will we'll watch some type of you know, Netflix going on. Me, me and Coach Corbs there at Vandy were kind of bouncing ideas off of each other. So, uh, so it's been good. But yeah, Mind Hunters is the one that we watch. All right. Really well. Nice. Yeah, I haven't gotten in on that one yet. We, we're, we're looking for options, though. So that's... Yeah. yeah, that's a good one. We really like that. And then I've watched a couple of the... Uh, I've watched a couple of the ones on, you know, ESPN. You know, the Trojan War. I had never seen that before. I, I thought that was really good. I watched the two Bills, Parcells and Belichick. I yeah. That was great. Uh, I watched uh, The Art of Coaching, Saban and, and Belichick. Um, and then Peaky Blinders, I grinded through that too. <laughs> that's uh, a good that's, lineup. Yeah, that's what we usually do from like 10 at night till about 1230. There you go. Uh, well, on the football side, I mean, you're, you're over here trying to, you know, not, not much spring uh, to speak of. You got a new offense, you're installing. Uh, what, what's been that like trying to, to put in a new system offensively through, I guess, Zoom meetings for the most part? Yeah, so we got a lot of work done before this all hit. So that that helped. Um, you know, then I think the first week, like most people, it was it was an adjustment. People were uncomfortable with it. And uh, but we've gotten into a pretty good rhythm now. We've got a lot of work done. And, you know, I, I like to say, you know, under all these situations, whenever a challenge or adversity comes, you know, you have an opportunity for growth and you have an opportunity to learn something about yourself and learn something about your organization. And I think we've done that. You know, this has forced a lot of us to embrace technology probably more than we ever have before. And uh, we've gotten a lot of work done with these Zoom meetings. We, we really have and have gotten pretty good at them. And that's offensive and defensive meetings, that's staff meetings, that's uh, professional development, that's recruiting, that, that's all of it. You know, um, it's, it's actually worked out pretty well. It's made me think about other ways that we can use this even, even during normal times. It's kind of an interesting dynamic. I know you have a good relationship with, with P.J. Fleck over at Minnesota. Uh, you go and, and, and take his offensive coordinator away from him. Uh, I'm just curious, how, you know, how did that play out for you? you know, what's, I assume you owe him a meal next time you guys get together. You got the tab. I mean, that, that's, that had to have been a kind of an interesting dynamic. Yeah, it's, that's never an easy thing to do whenever you hire anybody. And I'm one of these guys. I, I still call head coaches. A lot of guys don't do it. They just – they just hire people, and uh, I usually call and, and say, hey, I hate to make this phone call, but, you know, but, but I have to. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for me, I've been tracking Kirk for a long time. He's a PA guy. I try to kind of have an idea of guys from our footprint. I'll hire anybody from anywhere in the country, but I just think it helps sometimes when, when they're from the footprint. And Kirk's from Pennsylvania. So I've been tracking him for a long time. A good friend of mine is a good friend of his. You know, obviously, you know, we played them this year and he did a great job against us. So that factored in. Um, but yeah, I, I, at the end of the day, I got to do what's best for Penn State. You know, you've, you've obviously really um, settled into one of the more consistent programs in college football right now. And, and um, even through coaching turnover and all that sort of thing, you, you're all of a sudden uh, three years out of four, 11 wins and, and just are so consistent. Um, I think it's, it's really fun to kind of think back to, to where you were in 2016, a couple seven to six seasons, you start the season four and two, then you got the whiteout game and, and the big win over Ohio State. Um, and it feels like from that point forward, it's just been, been clicking um, for you at Penn State. I'm just curious if, if, 
if you could kind of go back, think back to that game, uh, what your memories are from, from that game and whether it's you could kind of sense that it was the sort of turning point, not just for the season, but potentially for the program that it certainly looks like it was as we kind of remember back on in retrospect. Yeah, you kind of triggered a couple other thoughts, too. You know, I think about my first year we played Ohio State, the year they won the national championship. We took them to double overtime. Yeah. And, um, you know, if if we win that game, maybe it kickstarts this a little bit faster. The, the other thing I would say to you is uh, I tell everybody I talk to, don't take over a program under sanctions. If you do a study – of uh, coaches that have taken over programs under sanctions, it very rarely ends well. Uh, during the interview process, they say, oh, we're gonna give you time, but, but then the fans don't care, you know, especially in these types of programs. So, um, yeah, I, I do think obviously that Ohio State win in year three, it was our first year off of mm -hmm. was back to 85 scholarships and, you know, obviously a huge momentum, you know, in our stadium, you know, it's interesting. Uh, a lot of our players that we were playing with that year were at the Michigan, you know, three or four overtime game when Billy O'Brien was here and we ended up getting a bunch of those guys to come to Penn State. Same thing, the, the Penn State win in the whiteout over Ohio State, um, same deal. I mean, you, you, you talk about being at a Penn State whiteout as a recruit uh, and being that type of environment, a big win. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt that it propelled us and, and gave us some momentum and had people start looking at us a little bit differently because we started to be a part of that, you know, playoff and national championship start conversation. Heading into this year, um, you know, build, being able to build off that year over year and now all of a sudden kind of having your feet under you this year. And, and um, you know, I, I just wonder, do you feel like that you are the type of program now that's that's sort of equipped to deal with the uncertainty that's going on right now, maybe more so than most, um, given whatever leadership and, and sort of culture has already been in place and ingrained in the program? Yeah, I think I think that's one of the things that you really want to try to do as a program is I think one of the most important things you can do, one of the first steps is to be a program that is consistent. You know, because the reality is the more times that you're part of that conference championship conversation and that playoff championship uh, conversation, you know, you're going to start to get those years where things start to fall in place for you. And it, it could be the ball bounces a certain direction. You get a little bit of luck. You get one more recruit. Uh, that is a difference maker. And, you know, for us, you know, we try to look at these things and say, you know, we're going to embrace the adversity and grow from this adversity and then I actually think we'll come out of this thing better and the best programs and the best organizations and the best individuals are going to learn something from themselves and hit the ground running come out of this one of the quotes that we've been using with the team which I love is a quote by Andy Grove and it says bad companies are destroyed by crisis good companies survive them great companies are improved by them and that, that's kind of how we've been we've been embracing this thing. And, uh, you know, I think we all grow when we're uncomfortable. And this has made us all uncomfortable and find different ways to communicate and find different ways to, to overcome challenges and issues. It's a great quote. Our, our boss at 24-7, Shannon Terry, has, has been hammering that one in on us as well. Um, maybe you know, maybe I, he stole it off of our Twitter page when we put it out, maybe. <laughs> maybe he did. Maybe he did. <laughs> Uh, the, the, before all this went off, before, before the, the quarantine and everything, um, I remember seeing on Micah Parsons Twitter page, there was a picture with you and Micah in a weight room and you guys were laughing about something and the caption was something to the effect of, uh, uh, coach Franklin response when I was asking to, to return kicks. And I know I'm, I'm the media member and I'm supposed to be unbiased here, but can I, on behalf of Micah, stand here and, and petition for a goal line series, wildcat package, a kick return package? Do we have a shot at anything like that with Micah Parsons in the fall? Yeah, I think, I think there's a shot. You know, it's, it's the fine line because when you do it and it works, everybody says it's awesome. And when a guy, you know, sprains his toe and or sprains his ankle and because he's doing that on the other side of the ball, your defensive coaches, want to kill you and then the other 50% of the media members all call you idiot. 
<laughs> and then on top of that, you know, we got one of the, you know, we got one of the better, deeper running back rooms in the country. You're going to take one of those guys off the field. You know, it's challenging. You know, for us, we've had Micah as that off returner as a backup for a while. Now, as a freshman, you know, we wanted to use him there, but we couldn't because he still had the mentality every kick was meant to come to him. So we'd have our primary returner back there, and Micah would just run over and catch it, you know, and, and take off all over the place. And I wouldn't say his ball security was great at the time, but uh, you know, he's earned some of that trust. As you know as well as I do, he can do it. You know, he can do it. There's no doubt about it. So there may be some things that we, we try to do with him and get him involved. Um, but again, it's, it's just a fine line because now I got to take Journey Brown, who I think you guys listed as maybe the you know, top five running back in the country next year in college football. And, yep. you know, and, and we, got, we got Noah Kane behind him and we got Devin Ford behind him and we got Keziah Holmes behind him. So it's just hard to justify taking one of those guys off the field when they've been so productive too. Um, well, Micah certainly is, you know, you, you speak to his versatility and he's, he's kind of a freak athlete and that's been sort of uh, pretty typical of you producing those sort of athletes um, with Dwight Galt, your strength and conditioning coach. And it just sort of seems to be every year in the NFL combine, there's some Penn State guy that's doing things that we didn't even realize uh, he could do. Uh, can you give me a little bit of a, of a hint behind the curtain? who the next freaks are. I, I assume Micah is, is, is kind of one of those guys. Have you got – I know K.J. Hamler probably would have run in the low four threes at worst had he competed in the combine. So I'm just curious who else you, you're ready to reveal whenever combine season comes around the next two or three years. Yeah, we were disappointed, uh, you know, because we actually think not only would have K.J. run, like you're saying, low four three, maybe high four two. You know, we actually think that, that – uh, Etor Grossmatos would have run, you know, high four five, low four six wow. as well, which which would have been great. And and you're right, you know, Coach Galt's done such a good job. Our guys kill the combine every single year. You know, but there's a number of guys, probably the guy that jumps out the most uh, in terms of testing. Now, now, you know, he needs, you know, he needs to take the next step on the field, which I think he will this year. But it's a kid by the name of Jason Owe. Is a defensive end that we got out of New Jersey. He was a basketball player. Uh, you know, we, we've timed him at 4.38 at 260-something pounds, and he can jump and all those types of things. And I think with, with this year and then hopefully the following year, you know, he's going to be you know, a chance to be one of those, those top-end picks. Uh, he's a guy that really jumps out. I'm, I'm kind of looking through here. Uh, but he's a guy that really jumps out. Journey Brown, you know, people forget that uh, Journey Brown broke um, the all-time 100-meter record in the state of Pennsylvania. And Leroy Burrell, who won a gold medal in the Olympics, he broke his 100-meter record. Ran like 10-4-3, rushed for over, I think, 800 yards in one game in high school. Um, you know, we think Journey, Journey will be a guy that can run high 4-2, low 4-3 as well at 210, 215 pounds. Uh, Castro Fields is a corner that we think will run really well and test really well at the Combine. Uh, we, got, we got a bunch of guys, you know, obviously Micah Parsons, uh, but there's a number of guys. I'm, I'm missing somebody, and I'm going to get some text messages <laughs> this thing with guys that are pissed. But, but we've done a pretty good job of identifying those guys, developing those guys, and allowing them to go play and, and play fast. Um, yeah, I mean, you, and you've certainly been one of the sort of on the front end from recruiting, and, and you always put together great classes, even back to your days at Vanderbilt. Um, I'm curious, I mean, just recently, NCAA has, um, it, it appears to be moving towards passing legislation uh, that would allow college athletes to profit off their name, image, and likeness. How do you, and, and you think of this, it, with a unique perspective, typically. And I'm just curious, um, you know, how you perceive those potential changes, whether that impacts the way you approach the recruiting process, whether you think it is something that's, that's good for the college game, for college athlete. What, what's sort of your response to, to that movement? Well, I think that this is what I would say. I, I'm in favor of anything that helps the student athletes out. What, what I don't like is people beat up the NCAA all the time and they don't really understand all the challenges and issues that come with it. 
you know, with, with Title IX and gender equity, whatever you do for a football player, you got to do for, for, for the other sports. Um, the other thing that factors in there is I don't think anybody has any issue, anyone in college athletics has an issue with what we're, we're proposing. But I think the, the challenge is how do you keep it, how do you keep it regulated and how do you make sure that people aren't taking this into in a direction that's not supposed to go? You know, uh, in recruiting, being able to tell guys, you know, on average, our players make $65,000 a year on this. And, okay, we're not able to set deals up, but people are doing it uh, behind the scenes with boosters and other things. So I don't think anybody has any issues, you know, even with the stuff that you see where the NCA gets beat up or you see on social media where a player started a business, he was doing a YouTube channel or right. they shut it down. Well, the, the NCA doesn't have a problem with that, but how do you regulate where the money's coming from that people are pouring into those businesses? You know, so it's just a lot more complicated than I think people realize. And it's easy to beat the NCAA up. But I think, you know, Barton, all these rules are in place for a reason because they've been abused at some point. So that's the challenge. I, yeah, I feel like a challenge too, in, a, in almost a different way that, that people like you are gonna have to deal with is the idea that um, you know, football is such a team sport. And I'm very pro, that I'm pro players and, and um, let the market decide their value and, and, and all of that. And, and, and I'm in favor of the legislation, but I also, I think it's gonna be interesting to see how coaches deal with an incentive, an, an incentive for players to be very um, me focused, to try to sort of build their own brand, perhaps even at the, the uh, expense of the team. Um, is that something that kind of worries you in terms of just the building, the, the actual uh, cohesive nature of, of a good football team? Yeah, I think it's a fine line. There's no doubt about it. And the reality is you're going to have to find a way to manage that. And you better be very intentional about how you're going to approach it. And you're going to have to be transparent with conversations with your players. Um, you know, because the reality is you're really only talking about a small, small percentage of guys that this is really going to impact. Does a guy like Saquon Barkley, you know, was he very marketable at the time when he was in college? No doubt about it. But there's also another 90% of the team that it probably really doesn't impact a whole lot unless people are, are uh, maybe working some you know, side deals and things like that, that, that probably shouldn't be happening. Or the offensive lineman, just based on the position he plays, he's a phenomenal player, but is not going to get the same opportunities that a running back or quarterback or wide receiver you know, may get or corner, whatever it may be. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's going to create – I think every, everything in the past based on colleges – and the athletes was based on everybody being on a level playing field as much as we possibly could make it. And this kind of throws that out of whack. You know, you're going to have some players that are really, you know, profiting from this and got unbelievable opportunities. And that's going to create envy and jealousy from other guys. And some of those guys may deserve it. Right. Just on the position they play or, you know, the, you know, what the market says, it may not play out that way. All right, so the elephant in the room here is just the, the uncertainty of, of the football season uh, in, itself in, in the 2020 season. Um, you're certainly preparing uh, and, and going about your business the best way you know. I, I know you're having conversations. I, I'm just curious, based on the people you're talking to, based on the preparations you're making, what are your expectations? Are, are, are you hopeful for a, a, a season to kick off in the fall? Um, do you think that we kick off later than that? Do you have any expectations for kind of what's ahead of us uh, in terms of the football season? A couple of things that I would say is, is number one, I'm pretty confident there's going to be football. Now, what it looks like, is it a full regular season? Is it a regular season that starts on time? Is it 12 games? Is it 10 games? Do we have bowls? I don't know. I, I, I apologize, but there's still a lot of questions yeah. out there. Um, but I do think there's going to be some form of football. Are we going to have fans in the stands or not? You know, all those things, I'm, I'm not necessarily sure. I do, I am confident that we won't have football unless the regular students are back on campus. One of the positives that I've seen over the last week and a half is 
president after president after president now are all coming out publicly saying we will be open in the fall. I think Arizona and Arizona State, I just saw announced today. So I think that's, that's positive momentum because I don't think you can justify bringing student athletes back and it's not safe for the overall students. Those things have got to work together. So I think that helps. Um, besides that, I, I, I don't really have a whole lot more to offer at this point because everything is just speculative. But I am a believer in science. And I think we should be relying on experts in the field. Um, and then I think school administrators and politicians should be listening uh, to the experts, you know, when it comes to disease control, when it comes to this virus. Um, and then obviously, I understand there's an economic impact as well, but I would hope that it starts with what's the right thing to do for people's health, and then also factors in the economic aspect of it as well, because we're not going to get to a point where there's, there, there's no risk. At some point, we're going to have to jump back in, and there's going to be some risk associated with that, but I would hope, once again, no different than I tell my players, every decision we make is best based on what's in the best interest of the program and then what's in the best interest of the individual. And I hope in this situation, it's based on what's in, in the health of our country and our people, number one, and then economics have to factor into, but in that order. Yeah, no doubt. Well, well, we'll hope for the best. I hope the scientists give us some good, good news here in the next few months. Um, really appreciating you. You sitting down in the middle of this and joining me and uh, best of luck the rest of the quarantine. Hope we get on the field here soon, coach. Always great to see you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be on.